brush your teeth at morning. Okay, please imagine that you see your toothbrush on your desk, please, the one that's tab in front of you. And I want you to please take the hand that you normally use, pick up your toothbrush and just brush your teeth, please. Thank you. Now put it down and pick up the same hand and start on the other side. The same hand that start on the opposite side. No, that's the opposite side of your mouth. You, you, you normally start on the left or the right. Just start brushing the other side. How does that feel? Weird. Why? Because we are brilliantly, uncom you know, consciously incompetent at forming patterns. Driving here today, how many times did you touch the brake? I don't know. Yet you do it. So we, we are brilliant at forming patterns and habits and means on how we operate and how we work. But unfortunately, the same ability, the same pattern-making process that we have, can help us to form bad and unhealthy habits. Now, I'd like to tell you a story that goes back many, many years, um, but to all of you, it's a And this starts in, in a story that comes from Manandrup. Manandrup, at the time, was basically the, the headquarters of, I don't know what the, exactly the situation is now, but it was terrible. It was violent, drugs, gangs. It was basically headquarters in this terrible area. It was so bad that the people from the normal service of the restaurant, the municipalities, plumbers, electricians, just refused to go in. It was just too dangerous. I was approached to help look at the problem, and a project was formed called Grow Man and Work. And the challenge was to say, what can we do about this place? Is it possible, to my mind, that if we could deal with Man and Work, one of the worst areas in Barrow in the world, we would have a model that we can export anywhere else. So I was quite happy to take that. What happened was quite amazing. In London Book, I met a man called Alex. Now, Alex was a gentle guy, an um, elderly gentleman, and he was quirky. Because like very often entrepreneurs, and I heard today that people say how difficult it is to get there, because entrepreneurs are sidelined. They are said, well, come back later, and then ideas are taken, whatever happens. But it's a long, frustrating, lonely journey. It is. And it's emotional, it's difficult, it's tough. So Alex was, like many entrepreneurs, not quite popular because he had his mission to do stuff, to sport and here, and people just, in the sideline, that is called quirky. And he didn't wear socks. Hence the story. But when people started finding out why he didn't wear socks, nobody bothered to ask him, one of my teeny people did. And I started telling people why he didn't wear socks. Because in his youth, Alex bought a pair of socks, and as he was about to put it on, he decided, no, I'm not going to put this on. In fact, I'm not going to wear socks again until everybody in Mullenberg could wear socks. That's why Alex didn't wear socks. And this was 100 years ago. He'd never wore socks. And people mocked him for it. But when they heard why, it changed the dynamic. Suddenly, it was not just a quirky guy. Suddenly, he cared about the thing. That is what makes entrepreneurs lonely. Because people like people that are like them. That's unconscious rapport. We like to be liked. We like to fit in. And entrepreneurs and pioneers, by definition, are different. They think in a frontier, in a place that doesn't exist yet. It's a student sitting outside who's busy developing robotics, who's working with something, getting frustrated because it's not working. He lives in the future. That's the place that he lives in, the time space continuum that he occupies. And what happens to him if he's called quirky, if he's with his artist, that's going to impact his ability to create and it's impact on his emotional life. In our society, for whatever reason, we have become very focused on results, ROI, return on investment. We can make money, of course, we can pay the bills, we can pay the overhead. But there is another component, ROL, return on life. How much effort do we put in return on life? It's a metric that doesn't exist. I've been talking about it for many, many years. I had a meeting, a long discussion with Clem Sunter many, many years ago, and he said to me, I asked him to quit and for the, the model. He said, fine, it's worth it. He said, but you'll have to wait 18 years. This is, nobody's going to nobody's going to be interested. I'm encouraged coming here today because it is. I see it. It is real. The time has. I spent the intervening years, the past 15, 18 years, working in a project to create simple models to understand emotional problems. Basically, because my life is so messed up and screwed up that I needed to make sense of it. So I wanted something that could work for me primarily, but I could 
it requires the growth of alcohol and abuse and violence in my life and actually makes sense to my world and my passion has always been to share. I am now grateful that the model is there, it works. It's called In Health Today and there's a non-profit organization called By Grace Today that's in parallel with that. And why? Because the model was part of how do you get to people to sit down and say, hey, I need help. If you have this, it's difficult for them to come and say, anyway, I need help anyway. Because people think that emotional help is when you're bad, when you're screwed up, when you're messy. And yes, there's that. There's emotional trauma, and we need to recover from that trauma. But there's also emotional health, which is just daily management. And there's so much about how the mind works, how emotions work that you can apply, that we just don't know. And then there's emotional fitness. People who really, if you want to really become a zone of decision making, problem solving, whatever it is, there are ways to help you do that because there's so much available about how this works and how emotions work. But the one thing that we all miss, we can make money. I've worked with many people who have banks accounts full of money, but their hearts were empty. They were hollow. Because they don't get the strokes, they don't get the love, they don't get the touch. And we can get so focused on that stuff that we forget who we are. Now, when you watch a rainbow or when you see a sunset, or when you see two people just being kind to each other, or somebody smiling, don't you get that warm feeling, the rainbow feeling? Yes, of course you do. Because it's in there, it's built, it's primordial, it's here, it's alive. So I'm asking you today to challenge you, to say that when you put on your socks in the morning, like I it's an unconscious thing. So much of what you do is unconscious, like brushing our teeth. We don't really think about it. Become conscious of what you do and what you say and how you say it. Because we've all heard this theory about a butterfly flapping its wings somewhere to create a thunderstorm or a tornado somewhere else in the world. Could a smile, could a touch, could a word of encouragement to someone, a young boy working in a robotics thing, make a difference? Not only to him, 18 years later, 20 years later in his life, but if he could spark, pass that on to others, what difference would that make? So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to tell you a story, another story, of what happened here today. As I walked in this morning, I was chatting to the kids, and one of the kids, I said to them, what are you doing? And one guy said, well, I'm busy with this, this part of the robotics experience, and the other one said, well, I'm busy with the program. I said, how's it going? He said, ah, not working. <laughs> no. I said, hold on, say that again, it's not working yet. And he said, what? I said, please just say it's not working yet. I said, I just say it. Just say it's not working yet, he said. And as he did, I saw his face with the chill up and said, yeah, that's cool. But yeah. If you think about it, if we say it's not working, that's it. If we say it's not working yet, it means unconsciously the will work. Now I've spent my life searching for answers to this kind of stuff. And this is a small example, a minute example of what is available and what we can do with two words, not yet. I have looked at mimetics, I've looked at neurosyntonics, I've looked at spiral dynamics, I've looked at transactional analysis. It's, it's, the information is there, but you need to just acquire it. I'm going to share it with you, I'm going to share it with the world. And in order to do that, I'm inviting you to participate real time, real now, and right now. Because this project, I don't, know if, I don't know if it's been mentioned, but standing here today is part of a social equipment program. That's why TEDx was created, to create a social involvement for the people in this area. Now, when I spoke to my wife before the session began about what happened after the, um, the, with the little guy who said the not yet story, she said to me, well, now you've, got to, now you've got to spread that. And I thought, well, why not? So I registered a website called notyet.co.za. If you go to survive, you can look at it now. Um, I hope. <laughs> and I'm inviting everybody to say, let's participate. How can we take that story? And by the way, get on there. You will see what the kid said. Um, this is what he said, and it, it, it's on there. What he said is that I was at a very angry state when the man came up and, and it all released all the anger because talking to someone else could really help to let out your emotion. And when he spoke to me about not yet, at that moment I lost all my emotions because I was sidetracked. I wasn't focusing on the problem, I was focusing on the solution. So, my invitation is do whatever you can to have our own.